Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDOP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntax Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDOP and ESTCP. Today's webinar will consist of a brief overview of the two programs, followed by the technical portion, which features research on life cycle assessment and developmental environment safety and occupational health evaluations. First, Mr. Brian Hubbard from Joint Program Executive Office Armaments and Ammunition will describe environmental safety and occupational um, health analyses um, in acquisition. His presentation will be followed by a Q&A session, uh, and it will be followed by a second uh, presentation by Dr. Andrew Henderson from Nobris, who will discuss incorporating life cycle thinking into research and acquisition. Andrew's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we'll, we will conclude uh, the webinar with a longer Q&A with both of our speakers. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast platform. Firefox, IE, or Edge are the most compatible browsers to use with Zoom. If you lose the content on your screen or if your screen freezes, try keying Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, Click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. You may, you may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties, because the Q&A option should be reserved for questions for our speakers. Uh, today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A sessions. Just a reminder that when you submit your questions, make sure to add your organization name at the end so that we can identify you during the session. With that, I would like to introduce Mr. Tim Tetro, the ESCCP Program Manager for Energy and Water. Tim graciously agreed to fill in for uh, Dr. Robin Nissan today, and Robin is the Program Manager for Weapon Systems and Platforms. Uh, before joining CERDAP and ESCCP, Tim worked at the National Renewable Energy Lab, where he focused on energy efficiency and renewable energy project development for the federal sector. Tim? Thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everybody to today's CERDAP and ESTCP webinar. I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of, <clears throat> of uh, CERDAP and ESTCP programs and then hand it back to Rula to introduce our first speaker. CERDIP is the Strategic Environmental and Research Development Program it was established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between DOD, the Department of Energy, and EPA. CERDIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERDIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important to all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring in the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. 
There are four program areas in CERTIP and five in ESTCP. Installation Energy and Water Program area is only an ESTCP program, while the other four, Environmental Restoration, Munitions Response, Resource Conservation and Resiliency, and Weapon Systems and Platforms, are CERTIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar is focused on research and demonstrations that are conducted under the Weapons Systems and Platform program area. This program area has essentially five major focus areas, surface engineering and structural materials, energetic materials and munitions, noise and emissions, waste reduction and treatment and DOD operations, and lead-free electronics. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. As you can see, upcoming webinars will cover, cover a broad range of topics, including genetic diversity and responses to climate change, advances in high resolution site characterization and sustainable coding systems for military platforms. The webinar on October 17th will feature speakers from both the environmental restoration and the weapons systems and platforms programs program areas and will address aqueous film forming foam impacts to subsurface environments, as well as capabilities assessment of fluorine free foams. You can find additional information about our upcoming webinars at this link and registration is now open for webinars through the end of the year. I'd also like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session will be downloaded uh, or can be downloaded from our webpage. Uh, on our uh, uh, on the webinar webpage. Uh, also, we would appreciate if you could uh, please take a few minutes uh, at the end of the presentation to complete a survey that will pop up on your screen. And finally, I'm pleased to announce that the CERTIP and ESTCP symposium will be held again this upcoming December in Washington, DC. The three-day event will showcase the latest technologies that enhance DOD's mission through improved environmental and energy performance. Registration information is available on the CERTIP and ESDCP website. With that, I hope you enjoy the webinar today, and I will hand it back to Rula. Thank you so much, Tim. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Brian Hubbard, who is the Environmental Safety and Occupational Health Officer for Joint Program Executive Office Armaments and Ammunition. Uh, Brian is located or works at Piccany, Piccany Arsenal in New Jersey. In his role, he serves as Principal Advisor uh, to the Joint Program Executive Office Armaments and Ammunition, as well as Subordinate Program Management Offices for all environmental safety and occupational health matters related to the active acquisition life cycle of conventional ammunition. In previous roles, Brian served as lead engineer for environmental compliance and pollution prevention modern, modernization programs throughout the Army industrial base. Uh, Brian earned a bachelor's degree in environmental engineering and a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Delaware, where his research focused on developing treatment methods for conventional and insensitive munition explosive waste streams. Brian, please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Deeb. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on slide 17, I uh, present an agenda where I'd just like to highlight our role as the Joint Program Executive Office Armaments and Ammunition and describe the phased environmental safety and occupational health assessments that are used as part of the technology development process and how these analysis support acquisition and material development, followed by discussing their benefits to the DOD and wrap up with a couple of conclusions. So on slide 18, so who, who are we at JPEO Armaments and Ammunition? Our mission includes leading the development, procurement, and delivery of those lethal armaments and ammunitions, providing joint war fighters overmatched capabilities to defeat current and future threats worldwide. Our priorities not only include delivering these capabilities, but also developing our teams and future acquisition leaders, uh, in practicing innovation to operate effectively and efficiently, optimizing the ammunition enterprise and looking forward towards the future. 
slide 19 provides an overview of our six program management offices within the organization, and I'd like to highlight a couple of those. PM Combat Ammunition Systems, or PMCAS, provides indirect fire munitions and mortar weapon systems. Examples include conventional ammo, mortar and, art and artillery, as well as the Excalibur ammo. PM Maneuver Ammunition Systems provides direct fire munitions to the warfighters, large, small, and medium caliber, as well as non-standard ammunition, items like the 5.56 and 7.62 millimeter. And PD Joint Services, or Project Director Joint Services, they manage and guide the industrial-based modernization at the government-owned contractor-operated facilities, as well as the demilitarization mission. Slide 20 provides an overview of, of environmental safety and occupational health deliverables in the acquisition life cycle. So how do we provide these capabilities to the soldiers and also meet these ESOH requirements? I'd like to highlight that the uh, capability or capability gaps identified early in the life cycle during the material solution analysis phase. And as the technology and process matures, there's different gates or milestones, B, C, and the full rate production decision review before the ammunition is enters the operation and support phase and is provided to the soldiers. Some examples of the ESOH evaluations and assessments to accomplish that include the PESHI or the Programmatic Environment Safety and Occupational Health Evaluation, a National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA assessment, as well as the Health Hazard Assessment, uh, which is performed by the Army Public Health Center to assess the impacts of the material to the soldier, as well as a toxicity clearance to assess impacts of the chemical components or composition to the soldier as well. And I'd also like to highlight that as the program starts, it begins with research development, technology, and evaluation funds, which begin with basic research and move and mature through the various budget activities to system development and demonstration. And as the program becomes more mature and is approaching that full rate uh, decision review, the RDT &E funds. Uh, wind down and the procurement funds begin. And eventually, once the item is fully deployed, uh, it, the funding transitions to operations and maintenance. Slide 21. The acquisition process begins with the materials solutions analysis phase. And what's going on here is that the project or program team identifies that there's a material solution, uh, in our case ammunition required, to address a, a capability gap. So, and these capability gaps are co converted or translated into system-specific requirements, such as key performance parameters, KPPs, or key systems attributes. Some examples of ESOH activities that occur during this early life cycle in phase identifying those ESOH subject matter experts to include as your project, to include in your project uh, integrated project team and that participate in the analysis of alternatives. We also want to ensure that ESOH planning for the future technology as it's matured is included in the systems engineering plan, which is a living document that captures the, the program's current and maturing uh, engineering strategy and how it integrates into the, the overall program management and life cycle effort. The purpose of the, the SEP is to guide that, that technical aspects as, it's, as the technology and project matures. We also want to ensure that ESOH aspects, such as compliance with uh, or anticipating compliance with environmental laws and regulations are included in the draft capability development documents. and and any initial requests for proposals that may be going out for contract support. Slide 22 is the next phase in the acquisition life cycle. So, so as the 
program passes milestone A, it enters the technology maturation and, and risk reduction, or TMMR. And here, the team and project is looking to reduce those technical risks, gaining an understanding of potential material solutions to warrant further investment as the technology proceeds towards milestone B, which is the official start of an acquisition program. So here in support of milestone B, the team is preparing the initial PESHI, which is to identify those ESOH risks, their statuses, any potential wastes associated with the, the ammunition or system, and also identifying the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act compliance schedule. Those, uh, any sort of development and fielding actions that, that could uh, trigger a compliance issue either in the, the development or fielding process. So those ESOH SMEs are also participating in the design activities, discussing prototypings, uh, potential adverse impacts to the, the end user or environment during production or use. And these ESOH risks are identified to leadership through the preliminary design review uh, included in the, the systems engineering plan, the life cycle sustainment plan, as well as the draft request for proposal. So slide 23. After the, the program's initiated, it achieves milestone B. The effort moves into the engineering and manufacturing development phase, or the EMD. Here, prototypes are begin to be designed, built, and tested, verifying that the operational requirements identified in the earlier life cycle phase are achieved and those risks are begin to be mitigated. And again, looking ahead to post milestone C towards the production and deployment. Here, the IPT is, is participating in identifying trade off and design activities. Uh, ESOH is one aspect of that, but it's, it's not the, the primary driver. The NEPA compliance schedule is also being updated, as well as the, the PESHI for milestone C. Now, the PESHI at milestone B. It's still early in the program. It's an initial risk identification document and planning to how to mitigate those ESOH risks and accepting them or which ones are acceptable. We're looking to obtain those ESOH approvals on the PESHI and the preliminary NEPA analysis and any sort of uh, endorsements. And uh, again, the any sort of draft proposals or scope of work that are going out, ESOH language should be included. And also the, the health hazard assessment and toxicity clearance are begin to be developed and refined for milestone C decision. Slide 24 after the, the, describes the production and deployment phase where the uh, program has achieved milestone C and the primary purpose here is to produce the system with the capability that, that satisfies the operational need. Here, low rate initial production articles are also uh, produced and used as production test assets, assets in this phase. And the technical processes of verification and valid, validation of the end item are uh, assessed and uh, taken into consideration. Here, ESOH activities, again, you'll notice that these ESOH aspects are, are iterative in nature to further uh, refine, identify, and reduce those, those risks as the program marches towards uh, material release. At each phase, and again, the, the NEPA compliance schedule is updated, the risks that were identified in the milestone B PESHI should be uh, further reduced. The health hazard assessment uh, is, is prepared and as well as the toxicity clearance and those ESOH risks are evaluated and accepted again. Slide 25, once the system 
and the LRIP articles are satisfactory and they uh, achieves requirements for the uh, for a production decision review. The uh, the phase and the acquisition life cycle phases operations and support. Here, the program management office is leading the product st support strategy, sustaining the system throughout its its operational use until demilitarization and disposal uh, occurs uh, in the future. And operational units begin to receive the material, and it's placed for uh, their use wherever the the need and capability gap has been identified. And that at the end of this phase, the demilitarization takes place at the, the end of the service life. So here, as the, the material is used, any sort of hazard reports that are developed or, or hazards that occur in the field, uh, feedback with the appropriate program management office, uh, and if there's an environmental safety or OC health aspect, uh, we'll address it at that time. Uh, if there's any sort of regulations that change, um, potential restriction of materials for production or uh, changes uh, at the industrial base sites where these items might be manufactured or depots where they could be um, assessed or, or going for rework, uh, we'll, we'll take into account changing regulations as well. And as these regulations or the uh, regulatory environment changes, the team will update the, the PESHI as, as required. And the NEPA analysis uh, would uh, occur uh, again, uh, kind of as, on an as required basis. And the health hazard assessment and, and toxicity clearance uh, are periodically assessed and, and reviewed as well. So how? So what are some policies guiding ESOH and acquisition? Slide 26 describes the our guiding acquisition policy, which is AR 70-1, which includes the National Environmental Policy Act in the 32 CFR. Part 651, as well as specifically calls out the, the PESHI, which is required regardless of acquisition category or size of the, the acquisition program. MIL standard 882, uh, the DOD standard practice for system safety, describes ESOH risk management throughout the system's life cycle from concept initiation through the demil and disposal. And as mentioned earlier, the, the planning is recorded in the, the systems engineering document. So this, these are also required per the DODI 5002. And table two below is a uh, copy from the, the DODI that, that just shows regardless of the acquisition category, the, the program manager needs to take the, those ESOH aspects of the program into consideration and prepare the PESHI and NEPA compliance schedule uh, for each one of these decision milestone reviews. So that's acquisition, and I'd like to speak a little bit on slide 27 regarding the phased ESOH approach and how the RDT&E can support the acquisition, how it does support the acquisition process leading to the material development and fielding. So at, within JPEO ANA, we depend on data and assessments developed during the, the research phase that ultimately support the, the full rate production decision review and material release. And just uh, because there may be a lack of applicable or available uh, ESOH data does not equate to no risk. In some instances, it may mean that there there is a risk to be addressed, but may not have been identified yet. Additionally, our organization assesses new energetics, compounds, coding uh, that uh, may be applicable to the material being developed or fielded. And before that new compound can enter the Army supply system, it may be subject to the Toxic Substances Control Act uh, through the EPA, 
which could ultimately require uh, additional evaluations through the, the consent order. And if these aren't taken into consideration early, we can, we can in, expect uh, cost and schedule impacts to developing and fielding that, that material. So the, the minimum data set also reduces uncertainty in planning, and it allows us on the JPEO side uh, to budget for any more uh, robust or in-depth tests that might be required before we can use that, that system or that new compounder chemical. Slide 28 describes three documents and three processes or approaches for using or employing a phased uh, ESOH evaluation approach. Uh, one was developed by the Army Public Health Center, the ASTM uh, 255216, uh, which was published in 2016, as well as a additional guidance document, which was developed by the Army Research Development and Engineering Command, formerly the RDECOM, now the Combat Capabilities Development Command. And this was published in 2017, the Developmental Environment Safety and Occupational Health Evaluation, or the DASHI. And I believe the international guiding document uh, was published in 2014, uh, called by the Technical Cooperation Program. And what's important and unique about each one of these documents and approaches is that they emphasize and employ a phased data collection approach consistent with the corresponding budget activity or technology readiness level. So that means that early in a program or in the development, doing more um, not as in-depth analysis, but just identifying those potential risks. And as the, the material matures, you're moving into more in-depth, robust analysis for these uh, new ESOH compounds or new compounds that could be used to develop uh, in, in our material. The DESHI on slide 29, uh, it's not a risk assessment tool, but again, a, a phased approach. And results from the DESHI are important to those acquisition deliverables mentioned early. Uh, specifically, the, the PESHI, the NEPA analysis, uh, the health hazard assessment, as well as any potential environmental permits, permits that may be required to manufacture the, the material or use it at installations and depots. Slide 30 is a notional DESHI process developed by the, the CCDC team, where on the left-hand side at, at Budget Activity 2 or early in the uh, program, uh, we're looking at the identifying the, the chemical and physical properties, water solubility, uh, Henry's Law constant, uh, as well as any or modeling using existing models to uh, assess or screen potential human health impacts, acute toxicity, potential cancer screening, as well as any uh, adverse impacts or predicted adverse impacts to aquatic organisms. As the, the program matures through the, the budget activities it, and technology readiness levels, the uh, assessments are, are somewhat iterative. And at the middle tier of development or by budget activity three, we're starting to look at those acute uh, short-term assessments and that of the, the compound to those uh, water receptors. And as the, the, pro the new compound or energetic is showing promise, and it looks like there's uh, a chance for it to be fielded, we'll begin to look at the fate and transport, uh, those chronic or subchronic uh, human health studies to support the, the toxicity clearance as well as the, the toxicity assessment and, and PESHI uh, for the material release and fielding. Slide 31 uh, shows a, uh, describes the, the DESHI data a little bit more in detail and also want to highlight that the 
DESHI data rec and the DESHI process recommends conducting these uh, measurements of the physical chemical properties and uh, corresponding health and ecotoxin fate in accordance with those prescribed uh, methods such as ASTMs, the OECD methods, uh, EPA methods, as well as employing good laboratory practices. Slide 32. So, on some of the advantages of the DESHI, it provides a direct and distinct link between the, the research and acquisition communities and the, the PM. Uh, there's an opportunity to identify potential risks associated with a particular compound or energetic prior to its transition and loading into an end, end item that's, that's released. And we're using and employing those. Uh, peer-reviewed, uh, so, uh, SME-verified methods to collect the data. And it's, it's a great approach that distinctly supports the industrial-based sustainment and, and Army readiness. Knowing these potential risks up front allows us to, to plan and pivot as necessary. Slide 33. Uh, Describes the the PESHI, you know, our, our guiding documents and requirements for uh, performing the this uh, evaluation comes from the the Army regulations, the DODI instruction, as well as the the MIL standard. Uh, required at each milestone, beginning at milestone B, uh, regardless of ACAT category. I think that shows that this is these ESOH analyses are are very important to elim eliminate those future liabilities. Uh, associated with developing and fielding material. Some examples of data and things that are taken into consideration, the corresponding uh, environmental impact, not only to infrastructure, but also to those installations and gaining commands. And it is a living document. Slide 34 is the uh, NEPA assessment. It's a statutory requirement per, per, per the 32 CFR. Uh, and some actions that require the NEPA analysis uh, are test and evaluation, material fielding, any sort of uh, system modifications, as well as uh, demill and disposal. So slide 35 describes a little bit more detail about the mill standard. Uh, I'd like to highlight the environmental hazard analysis using the risk assessment matrix in the, the lower right-hand corner. Um, and failure, again, failure to identify those potential ESOH risks are, are going to impact the, the cost schedule and performance uh, across the system life cycle. So in, in conclusion, on 36, the, the PESHI and NEPA are statutory and regulatory required documents uh, at each milestone decision and support the material fielding. And the opportunity to address these ESOH risks decrease as the program matures and those RDT and E funding lines uh, become reduced. And the DESHI provides guidance to collect the, the right and relevant data at the proper time of the, the technology uh, development uh, using those standard methods. And the absence or lack of the ESOH data doesn't equate to minimal risks. Uh, slide 37, the DOD benefits uh, in understanding these potential impacts of new materials early allows our program management offices to plan and for uh, potential efforts to reduce those risks. And uh, we're after identifying these risks and reducing them earlier rather than later. So, uh, for additional information, uh, please visit uh, www.pica.army.mil uh, for a little bit more information on uh, the JPEO ANA as well as uh, Picatinny Arsenal. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Brian, for a great presentation. We have received a number of questions. Uh, the first one is from the CCDC Ground uh, Vehicle Systems Center, and it goes as follows. What is a toxicity clearance, and might it be similar to the hazardous materials management report of the PESHI in the Ground Vehicle Systems Center? 
That's a, a great question, and I can speak to the, the toxicity clearance as it relates to the ammunition development and, and fielding. So the for before Milestone B, our uh, program management office or the program officer, project officer will request a toxicity clearance for the potential or the candidate materials for the, the item to be developed and uh, partner and, and request support from the Army Public Health Center to, for the toxicity clearance or assessment to identify those uh, potential risks and at, at what exposures and adverse effect may occur to the soldier or the end user. Thank you, Brian. And the second question is, is from the SUNY School of Public Health in Albany. Uh, in the process you described, are risks to workers in the supply, in the supply chain evaluated? Yes. Uh, for example, uh, the occupational health to, to workers at the industrial-based production facilities are uh, taken into consideration when uh, developing or producing a new material. Uh, again, we'll partner with the production facility or and the Army Public Health Center and request an industrial uh, hygiene assessment. Great, thank you. And the second uh, or third question is from Betel. Uh, are the HHAs PCs and our PESHIs eventually delivered to installation level safety and health organizations such as uh, preventive medicine detachments and gar garrison safety offices? So as part of the material development and, and fielding process, our guiding army regulation is AR 700-142. And as we pursue the material release, the NEPA analysis and corresponding PESHI are included as part of the, and per the regulation, included as part of the, uh, and mentioned in the memorandum of notification and material fielding plan that goes out to the um, through the life cycle management command to the end users and installations. Great, thank you. Uh, and here is another question from Mantech. Um, your presentation referenced a by the book acquisition cycle. What experience do you have with rapid acquisition processes and the pressure this places on ESOH, uh, PESHI assessment processes. So as if, as I understand it, the, the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act assessment, is required by law. So I, I don't foresee that, um, that requirement going away. Great. Thank you, uh, Brian. Um, how are impacts to training lands assessed? Are impacts modeled or measured? And how are those studies conducted, if any? So as part, uh, again, I'll uh, refer back to the, the 700-142, the uh, material developers, the intention or the, the perspective is that the uh, the material developer or organization prepares the programmatic NEPA analysis, um, and then the installations would use that document, which describes the the general environmental aspects of the this munition to tear off of that to perform site specific analysis. Uh, we're not always privy to where all of the the material is fielded, so it'd be very difficult for our teams to assess uh, all of the site-specific impacts across Army. Thank you. 
Um, what is an approximate average time frame for the full acquisition uh, life cycle? And how does your phased approach incorporate new or updated ESOH requirements? Sure. So the uh, it's always best to start early with the ESOH analysis, and we work with our, our partners at the Armament Center and, and Combat Capabilities Development Command to identify those risks and plan for them as early as possible. It it, it kind of depends on the program manager schedule. Uh, there's not one consistent schedule across the board. All right, and one last question, and we'll get back to the remaining questions towards the end of the presentation. Um, did you see a big need uh, for uh, 6.1 basic research in the development of new processes or products? I would say that the information developed as part of the 6.1 is important as long as it's aligned with the JP or with the material developers need to field that capability and requirement and as long as they they sync up and are communicating and can develop programs uh, then everybody wins Great, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, at this point, we're gonna move over to our uh, second portion of our um, today's presentation. And this part will be delivered by Dr. Andrew Henderson, who's a senior sustainability engineer uh, at Nobles in San Antonio, Texas. Andrew's current work focuses on the development of data, approaches, and tools to rapidly assess the life cycle cost, occupational and uh, environmental performance of Department of Defense systems. Uh, prior to becoming a consult consultant, Andrew served uh, in roles in both academia and government for seven years, working at the EPA National Risk Management Laboratory in Cincinnati and the University of Texas School of Public Health in Houston. Andrew has authored over 20 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters he earned a bachelor's degree in physics from Williams uh, College in Williamston, uh, Massachusetts, a master's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Texas in Austin, and a doctoral degree in environmental engineering from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Andrew, please proceed. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deeb, and, and thanks to the organizers for the chance to talk, and I'd, I'd like to First of all, say thanks to SERP and ESDCP and especially Dr. Neeson for the chance to, to work on this and the sort of collaborative spirit that they and the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the environmental group has brought, uh, and especially colleagues at FRCSE, whom I will discuss today, and of course, colleagues at NOBLA. So uh, that's, that's the preliminaries. And also thank you very much to Mr. Hubbard for setting the stage so nicely. I think we're both looking at similar problems, but from different angles. <clears throat> so that we're bringing complementary uh, and not duplicative approaches to addressing the same questions. So today, uh, on slide 41, we'll be talking about requirements and drivers for, for doing sustainability analysis. We'll be looking at a case study of electroplating alternatives uh, at a maintenance depot. I'll talk about some of the tools and resources that are available uh, to help serve the SCCP and other researchers do this sort of work. And then we'll wrap up and get back to more questions. And I really think that combining these two talks uh, in, in one session will be great for generating some, some really insightful questions that address all of these topics. So on slide uh, 42, we look at the sort of overall picture here of the national defense strategy and wanted to point out that this strategy includes essentially costing. So the first two bullets for lethality and alliances are things that indeed sort of ESTCP researchers address, uh, but particularly the performance and affordability are, I think, where we have an uh, opportunity to bring new technologies to bear. 
And there's a lot of uh, guidance to address affordability, as many of you all know, and, and Mr. Hubbard referenced some of that. But if we look uh, on the following slide, 43, we see that the, the, uh, the DODI 5000.02 milestone sort of setup is potentially misleading. And, and this is from the DAU, this slide, uh, the, top, the top bar suggests a sort of equal distribution in time almost of, of these milestones. However, when you look at costs, which is shown at the bottom, the vast majority of costs appear in the sustainment phase. And, and I'll just quickly clarify that sustainment here really refers to what some people would call operations and maintenance, but it means keeping weapon systems and platforms functioning and available for the warfighter. Uh, when we talk about a sustainability analysis, we're talking about this sort of broader sustainability, <clears throat> helping the DOD to continue to uh, function and provide all the, all the services that it does. So, so let's not confuse those two terms. Um, so let's step back and think about acquisitions, and Mr. Hubbard alluded to this, in this graph, we're looking at sort of time, sort of uh, acquisition milestones across the x-axis. The y-axis is showing us some cost. And we've got a few different lines here. The top line, which is in light blue, if you can see that, suggests that cost gets locked in very early on, once you've designed a product or selected a product, selected a material solution. Um, <clears throat> the actual realization of that cost, when, the, when it hits the, the budget books, is certainly happening during the operations or the sustainment phase. Um, but there's the, there are these dotted lines at the end off to the right-hand side where we suggest that perhaps there could be overlooked costs. And, and some of the questions alluded to this, uh, what, about the, what about the warfighter who's exposed to noise? What about the, the supply chain worker who's exposed to hazardous chemical? Um, and indeed, there have been examples of this. The, the tungsten bullet, the effort to replace lead bullets with tungsten was great, except for the fact that the the shattering of the bullets produced a very mobile, uh, bioavailable tungsten. So, so looking at these overlooked costs, and I know that that's a bit of an oxymoron, is what we're trying to accomplish with this tool. Um, finally, there's an orange line that, that is an alternative that perhaps suggests looking at alternatives early on can help us identify lower cost options. So to do this, we have to think holistically. We have to think all the way from design to disposal, which is what, what's happening in the Deshi and Pesci already. So, Life cycle thinking is the term that we use for this, and it suggests that for any system or product one uses, it's really, it really behooves us to think about where that product came from and what the raw materials that went into that product are, what, how do we get the electricity, how do we get the, the chemical that we need, and, and for the precursors for that chemical, where did they come from? So it's a very holistic way of thinking, and this, this diagram shows a sort of linear flow of, of, say, materials from resources to materials to component, et cetera. And of course, remanufacturing and reuse uh, and recycling are very important for, for uh, uh, say, recovering rare earths. But the idea about the life cycle is that we want to think all the way up into the supply chain to identify potential issues. We want to think all the way downstream, not just to disposition, but to disposal and the future fate of that disposed material and think about where there could be issues. So the questions one would address in a life cycle perspective are, are questions at the, at the bottom in the bold are about trade-offs. Is it worth doing this? We pay more, but do we get something uh, in return in terms of health or reduced environmental li liability? We're getting increased performance and is that trade-off worth it? So lots of questions. Um, it's a very exciting tool and, and so I hope to convince you of that today. So I'll talk a little bit about the framework for how to do this, how to address these trade-off questions. So there is in existence, uh, and you'll, you'll find this at the uh, website at the end of the talk, um, a DOD sustainability analysis uh, framework. And it starts here on the left with an understanding of, of the system. And this is where, of course, the people who intimately know the system and have developed it and have trouble <coughs> done troubleshooting, et cetera, they understand the system and they're able to abstract it into costs up here on the top line, which we then feed into sort of life cycle costing approaches, which are relatively standard to, to calculate costs in dollars over time. And on the bottom into physical and energetic inputs and outputs, and I should say energy inputs and outputs, not energetics. Um, and so these are the, the electricity it takes, the raw materials one buys, the, the labor uh, hours, the workplace exposures. And from these, we calculate occupational environmental liabilities using life cycle assessment tools. And so the, the ESOH data that Mr. Hubbard referred to is, 
is critical here. And, and so this tool doesn't work without the data that, that he spoke about. Um, so this really builds on that. So from these two, now we've got our LCC and our LCA, the costing and, and environmental liabilities. We sort of combine them into a sustainability analysis. And a final important step, of course, is to uh, communicate. So as, as was the case with all the lab work that Mr. Hubbard mentioned, these practices, the, the approaches that we described here and, and in the sustainable analysis guidance document are very much in line with existing practice and international standards even, and you can, of course, read them all, but both of them, the costing and the life cycle assessment are only as good as the input data that one has, and so that's why that understanding of the system uh, is critical. <laughs> so as a, as a researcher, how does this apply to you? Well, the, the Defense Acquisition Guidebook uh, strongly recommends, if not requires, uh, an execution of a sustainability analysis, and sort of ECSDC is beginning to require these analyses. And so this guidance document is available on the website you see at the bottom, which is also at the end of the slides. And this document provides examples, provides some uh, theoretical discussion of why we do this, um, and provides some tools and resources linked to those. And so I'll talk about those as well. This document is here and it's for people to use. And I will next talk about an, a little case study we did with the Fleet Readiness Center Southeast in which we were able to walk them through and work with them alongside with them using this document and I really appreciate their cooperation and questions and collaboration to make this process, make this document better. So the case study involves a corrosion protection approach that uh, previously for, for some of the materials they're working with, landing gear, et cetera, they're using cadmium electroplating to, to prevent corrosion in the field, and, and they were interested in switching to a zinc nickel based electroplating. So, this would be a CAD free electroplating, and this is in line with a CERTIF ESTCP goal of reducing chrome and CAD use by, by 90% at some of the depots over the next years. Um, so, of course, we want to understand life cycle costs of these switches, of the switch to zinc nickel. We want to understand potential occupational or environmental issues. Um, and at the sort of high level, the OS, OASD level, the, the interest here in the analysis is to avoid burden shifting. So, so suppose you switch to zinc nickel uh, electroplating solution, but perhaps the preparation of zinc nickel is, is highly, highly energy intensive. Is it, is it worth paying for that energy? Or perhaps it uses a ton more water. Is this worth using in some water stress areas? So these, again, are these trade-off questions that, that a high level uh, <clears throat> decision maker would want to know about. And of course, uh, FRCSE is interested in, in understanding costs and issues, but another benefit of this tool is communicating the value of making, making the capital investment to switch to zinc nickel, making that argument up the, up the command chain. So the picture there is, is an electroplating bath from another, another depot. Um, so let's talk briefly about these plating lines themselves. And what I will, what, what want to take away from this is that the plating lines themselves are highly complex and the, the chemistry, the, the plating process, and the service preparation, et cetera, is, is well known and, and probably uh, uncomfortably familiar to the FRCSE people. They spend their time looking at this, improving it, um, and, and so they know this backwards and forwards. And so they know about the surface preparation, they know about the acid activation, et cetera. And working with them, we were able to abstract that to a representation that we could then use in the in the sustainability analysis tool. Uh, just briefly note at the bottom, this 15 year lifespan refers to the lifespan of this plating line, not the corrosion <coughs> protection. So once you once you've coated a material, it has a certain lifespan in the field that's anticipated and it comes back in for repairs as needed or according to a programmed cycle. So this lifespan is for the for the um, line itself. In this analysis, we excluded capital costs with building this line because it already exists. And, and we did sort of look at post and, and pre-treatment as well. The zinc nickel line, again, I'm not gonna get into the chemistry. You can see it's a little bit uh, simpler in terms of, of complexity of the, the, the steps in the bath. But uh, I will point out that the lifespan is the same. And in this case, the capital costs of, associated with building the line are included in the analysis. So the question is, is it worth switching to the zinc nickel line, given that we're gonna to have to invest a certain amount of capital on this? Also, the last bullet there, we did 
consider different scenarios in which there is a regular la labor situation and also partial automation, which can, of course, cost more money but save a little bit of, of labor costs. So I mentioned the abstraction, and here in the in this slide, we're looking at a, a process, what we're calling a plus, process flow diagram. <laughs> On the right-hand side are the, the quote-unquote well-known processes where at FRCSC, we produce process or they produce process water they run the plating line <clears throat> that box there on in the top line on the right is into that box is the are all the previous uh, electroplating baths that we saw into those and coming out are components and, and leaving them are plating components there's uh, wastewater treatment that happens on site and air emissions that are treated on site as well now on the left hand side of this diagram are the quote-unquote less well-known items, which are things like electricity, tap water, uh, consumables, hazardous waste, etc. So when, when FRCSC operates this process, they have to buy electricity, they have to dispose of hazardous waste, and they do this by purchasing those services and, and goods from the economy. So with the help of OSD, um, Nobus has developed this defense input-output database that allows one to essentially buy goods from the economy and understand supply chain impacts of those goods. And I'm happy to talk about that more with people if they're curious, but let's leave that abstraction at that level. So for these purposes, we're calling this the background, the supply chain, and then the well-known items are the foreground. And those are the things that are happening in the shop that are, that are modeled by the researchers and understood. So we compare these two plating lines, one is zinc nickel, one is, is cadmium, over their 15-year lifespan of the, of the lines, we look at cost per square foot, and we include uh, the, the LCA, the environmental potential environmental issues, to avoid that burden shifting. All right, so the costs here are shown a couple different ways. This, this table is, has been confusing to people. It's actually normalized to the largest value, which is the middle. So let's, <laughs> you can look at it later and understand it. But let's move to this bar chart, which is somehow more uh, intuitive to people. Um, we're looking at our three options here from left to right, the cadmium baseline, zinc nickel without automation with respect to labor, and the zinc nickel uh, with partial labor automation. And we've got four different categories of recurring costs here. So we're not showing capital costs, <clears throat> just the recurring costs. And we've got waste management in yellow at the top, and you can see that 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 value is largest for the existing line. They're producing more hazardous waste. It costs more to throw it away. Um, utilities, such as electricity, also higher in the, in the gray. The orange section materials, essentially similar, but it is actually smaller for zinc nickel as well. And then labor costs, which obviously are, are important here. The artisans in these depots do a lot of highly skilled work, and, and that's always going to be the case. Um, but it's good to understand that. So. So looking from left to right, we see that the zinc nickel line without automation, so identical to the cadmium line with respect to labor, has lower per square foot costs. Um, and then of course, if we add some automation, the capital costs would go up, that's not shown, but the labor costs would go down. So, so indeed, the labor costs are driving around 50% of this cost per square foot, and then uh, capital, which is not shown, uh, is important. We, we do look at that in the next slide. So here we're looking at some of the information from the previous slide, which is that cost per square foot is shown at the top. Cadmium about $1,800 per square foot plated and zinc nickel $1,300 to, to $800 uh, depending on automation. So the chart below that, the table, shows these costs now over the 15 years. So we're moving away from per square foot to a total cost um, you can do the math and and check all this, but what we what we do add uh, here is the ability to see that <clears throat> these total costs, the bottom line, the total recurring costs now are sort of intelligible from a de decision making point of view. If we want to install the zinc nickel line, is it worth the additional cost, which is not shown, but we know that recurring costs are going to be approximately $800,000 cheaper those 15 years, comparing the total cost for cadmium versus zinc nickel uh, columns two and three there, is it worth the, the capital cost to, to pay for that? And then of course, you could ask the same question about the last column, is it worth installing some automation 
to reduce recurring costs more upfront for savings down the line. And those are the, those are the sort of discussions that, that uh, decision makers want to have. So this is the costing picture, and this is all based on their understanding, the researchers' understanding of how much it costs to, to run the lines and how much the, the materials cost, the electricity costs, et cetera. The other part of the sustainability analysis, which is the next slide, is the external costs. And these are the impacts upstream and downstream to, to potentially uh, supply chain workers, potentially to the surrounding community, potentially to the environment. And again, this is a discussion for another time. I'm happy to have with anybody who's curious, but, but the life cycle assessment models take the, the emissions of and releases of chemicals, the use of energy, the emissions of particulate matter, and convert these into dollar values in terms of human health, in terms of ecosystem quality, in terms of resource extraction. And so these dollars are not to be compared to the other dollars. They're meant to be compared internally so what we're showing here is, is uh, the baseline and then three different scenarios which are identified in those bullets there where we consider because there was some experimental evidence to this uh, effect that perhaps the zinc nickel would in fact last longer than the cadmium plating. So this we hadn't talked about before, but now if we say, well, if the zinc nickel lasts twice as long, then I only have to do the process half as often, et cetera. So we, we consider a 30% improvement in performance and a 200% improvement in performance, performance, which scales some of the results accordingly. But what one would do as a researcher here is, is consider the CAD baseline, looking at the graph now in the blue, and see that that baseline does seem to have some potential environmental liabilities associated with resource use, uh, human health, and, and climate emissions. And so this is not meant to be the end of the story. One would then be curious and dig into the data a little bit and see what what is it about the process that's causing these things? And you could then begin to ask questions. Is this, is this real? Is this data uncertain? Should I improve it? Or could I change the process and change some of these issues? So this is, this is a second part of the um, sustainability analysis. And then the last part, after we've done costing and this life cycle assessment to get the external costs is to communicate this. And this is where it's particularly useful up the command chain so for example, we can, from the data we've collected, we can abstract some very useful numbers and say, well, how about pounds of cadmium use? All right, when we, when we have the cadmium line, we're using 45 pounds annually with zinc nickel, it's zero. And then you can look at costs relative uh, between the two situations. So collecting all that data, abstracting it to the levels necessary for the sustainability analysis, and then condensing it down to this format, uh, I think has been very useful for those researchers. And so, so this, is, this is really the goal of the analysis, is to help you identify potential risks and to help, help you communicate. Uh, you can then take those same data and scale up. So go away from the depot level and look at the entire Navy. Um, and we won't get into this right now, but basically there's some scenarios for, for purchasing landing gear versus maintaining landing gear. And the value of the zinc nickel line becomes clear now that you could you could say we could be talking about millions of you know tens of millions of dollars here and that's of course effective for communication so the case study uh indicated that that uh corrosion was that the, the, the new material could in fact save money and if it performed better than the existing material it would indeed save more money um, and as always, there's uncertainty. So when, when there's a clearly important parameter, it's always good to iterate a little bit and go back and look at it. So in case labor here was very important for us, so, so if this study were to continue, one would iterate on that and try to refine those labor estimates. And as I indicated, uh, the sustainability analysis allows one to communicate up the command chain and also gives you a really high level picture of, of pros and cons of an alternative. So, uh, as I mentioned, there are tools and resources available to help uh, researchers do this. Um, I mentioned the first bullet, the DIO, the, the, the database. Um, the DOD makes available characterization factors and, and scoring factors, which allow you to take dollars spent on electricity and turn them into, into uh, say, environmental issues, environmental liabilities. Um, there are plen there's plenty of open source software available for you to do this. And, uh, 
that of course has its own learning curve. Um, Noblis has been helping serve VSTCP to develop a web tool called Spark LC that would allow you to kind of take your, your understanding of the system, abstract it, put in a few values, and get a high level picture of, of trade-offs. And I'll quickly show you that. So I, I concocted a notional plating example. On the left-hand column, I'm showing some of the supplies and, and uh, purchases, you know, electrical and, and, and material supplies needed. So for example, there's deionized water that's a user-defined process. And then my three examples across the right, the plating one, one and then two A, two B, use high, medium, or low amounts of that material. Um, and so with just these, what is it, one, two, three, seven, eight, items, I knew how much truck transport there was, how much natural gas combustion there was, I was able to plug this into the web tool and get a result that indicated, look, there are some trade-offs. So for the plating 2A, there was more, a little bit more human health issue. For the plating 2B, there's a little bit more climate change issue. So, so these are the kind of trade-offs that one can, one can make. And so we think that that's really exciting and we really love to talk to people who are beginning to ask these questions and help to either get you using open source software or, or DOD's uh, scoring factors or indeed this tool. So um, in conclusion, the, I really want to emphasize, and I think many of you understand this, but especially with the national defense priorities here aiming at, at affordability, weapon systems and platforms really have high costs during the operations and sustainment phase. Um, also liabilities associated with this, worker health, uh, down the line we, we found has been expensive. And as, as Mr. Hubbard indicated, this needs to be identified early on or else you're kind of locked in across the life cycle. So this needs to happen early on at research and design. Uh, to really do a systematic look, you need to use the sustainability analysis, and then there are these tools available to you. Um, and we really hope that you will use them. So for DOD, the, the takeaway here is we're talking about improving affordability, um, and then to do that, helping researchers at sort of ESCCP and elsewhere identify these issues early on and making use of the ESOH data that, that uh, is collected through groups like Mr. Hubbard. So thank you very much for additional information. You can visit the Novus website or uh, the Denix website here, and we look forward to your questions and to talking with you. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. We've actually received a number of questions for you. We're gonna start with one from NSWC Carderock. Uh, in the example that you discussed, did cost assessment consider the community impact of job loss uh, associated with automating a process requiring skilled labor? Excellent question. No, it did not. We talked about it, but it was out of scope, but that is certainly something that would be worth including in analysis if, if one felt that was important. That, that is certainly an impact of, of automation. Very good question. Uh, second question, uh, which impact assessment method is being used to assess the life cycle impact and what is the basis for uh, the evaluation of the impacts to calculate external costs? Okay. The, as an LCA person asking that, the impact method that's built into the scoring factors and the DIO right now is, is the Impact World Plus method, which is a publicly available and peer-reviewed method created by American and European researchers, uh, essentially, I mean, global, but, but most of those two areas. Um, and the valuation is certainly an area of discussion. Right now, we're using an approach from a fellow called called Bo Vitema, who is associated with uh, uh, University of the Netherlands, that uses some, I think, willingness to pay data to create valuation for, for impacts to human health and environment. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, the example shown in your presentation was for an existing technology. How would the analysis be different if it were conducted earlier in the acquisition life cycle? Yes, another good question. As, as, any, as you all know, earlier on, there's much more uncertainty. So with 
with uncertainty comes the need for more iteration and potentially more sophisticated uh, calculation approaches. So we have done some work for a, a novel technology in which a lot of the parameters were estimates, the number of labor hours to produce this chemical, the, the potential uh, human health issues. Um, so it becomes, if the uncertainty is high enough, it becomes a little more involved in terms of either iterating sort of manually using the using spreadsheet or the software, or you can set up a full-blown Monte Carlo kind of calculation or, or other approach to, to deal with those uh, uncertainties. And then, then you sort of run the analysis. And if you find that the, that the uncertainty prevents you from, from gathering any insight from that analysis, then you need to go back and refine those, un those uncertainties. But it, it certainly can be done. And I think the message would be that it's very valuable early on uh, to try to get an idea of potential issues. And it, it may be that the analysis is inconclusive, which I think would be an indication that a, a novel material or a novel system is, at least at this level, essentially identical to the previous one. And so you'd have to look for other differentiators. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any plans to conduct uh, a comparison of the sustainability predictions to the actual realized cost after a change is implemented? We have certainly talked about it. I think it'd be a fantastic uh, investigation to do. It's just hard to find uh, funding and time for that. I think once, once something's been implemented, people generally like to move on and, and just and use the new system. But uh, certainly if anyone wants to do that, I think it's worthwhile and, and uh, would be a good idea. Um, have previous lessons learned from past experience been incorporated into the tools that you're developing, or is there a way to do that? I will answer that sort of two ways. Um, first, the, the, the researchers at FRCSE found this useful and have begin in, begun incorporating requirements for it into some of their contracts. Uh, so in that sense, it has been incorporated. As for the tools, um, the, the actual sort of calculation framework, such as the, the Impact World Plus method that I mentioned, those are updated by researchers uh, as, as sort of global data become available. But uh, I, think, I think that when, when we do this analysis for a particular system and the, the investigator finds that, for example, this particular chemical in the supply chain is an issue for workers, um, we haven't yet seen a change occur because of that, but we have definitely seen conversations started to say, let's, let's work on getting this chemical out of the supply chain. Let's, let's change this system up. Wonderful. And one last question for you before we, before we pull Brian back in. Um, as a researcher, um, what, what is your recommendation on how much data would one need to conduct this sort of analysis? How much is enough? Right. Always a good question. Uh, I think part of the answer is, is that iterative approach, but but the hope is that in our experience working with, with researchers is that, as I indicated, you all on the phone doing your research, you know, you have a pretty good sense of the, the inputs required, the energy required, the, <laughs> the materials required. And so for a preliminary approach, it's actually, I think, quite manageable. You could almost sit down in an hour, abstract your system to something that would be amenable to this sort of analysis. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's relatively little. Um, it also builds on some of the ESOH data that's been collected uh, in the DESHU process. However, if one were trying to really refine an analysis and, and make some subtle distinctions between systems, then one might need better Henry's Law of Value, or one might need to have a much more concrete estimate of, of the labor required, the amount of, of a chemical required. So. So the answer is it can be small, but it, but as fidelity increases, it can become can become large. Uh, so maybe that's a bit invasive, but <laughs> it's definitely usable and workable from the start. Excellent. Thank you so much. 
Um, and as we start to wrap up, um, I'm going to pose uh, just a couple of questions to both you uh, and Brian here, and maybe we'll start with Brian. Uh, Brian, what is the last message you would like to leave our audience with today? Thank you, Dr. Deeb. Uh, thank you again for the, the opportunity to present and discuss the role of uh, those phased ESOH as well as ESOH and acquisition. Uh, the last message I would like to leave with the audience is that uh, to please consider those environmental safety and occupational health impacts as new technologies are developed and consider using the, the DESHI and ASTM and uh, TTCP methods to evaluate those potential impacts once the, the technology is fielded. Thank you, Brian. Andrew? Well, if, if I may, it's a bit derivative, but I would echo Brian's message and say, <laughs> in addition to collecting all those data, you can then use them in a, in a sustainability analysis again with the goal of trying to identify risks and issues down the line so that so they're not locked in early on at the design stage. Great. Uh, I'd like to thank you both for taking the time to give this webinar. The content was really interesting. Um, at this point, I would like to go ahead and uh, remind uh, our audience that this uh, webinar program is um, occurs every couple of weeks with uh, um, the next webinar taking place on Thursday, October through uh, October 3. It will be in the resource uh, conservation and resiliency program area and it will address genetic diversity and annual cycles as related to climate change. Uh, this webinar will feature two speakers. Dr. Julie Heath and Mr. Jason Winyarski, both of Boise uh, State University. Uh, registration is open, so please do visit the, the Third Up ESCP webinar webpage to register for this and other future webinars. Before we conclude, I would like to echo Tim's message and remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.